It's great to be here today. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. And you don't know how grateful I am to just be here. Yes. Hallelujah. Praise God. How many would agree with me today that we're living in a time that some would call perilous times? Would you agree with the first book of Timothy that we're kind of walking through that right now? And the things that we see coming upon us and the things that's happening around about us. But always remember this, which we will be, re- we'll, we'll get to this scripture later on in Isaiah 60, where it says, you know, that there's going to be darkness and gross darkness and all that stuff, but that the glory of God is going to rise upon all of us. Amen. Amen. And we're going to be a blessing to all those round about us. So we know that there's no doubt, according to Scripture, I've heard it since I was a little tyke and soon be 86 years now, that Jesus is coming soon. He's coming soon. He's coming soon. Well, again, if you don't believe that, you better start looking around about you just a little bit. Read just some of God's Word and you'll find out He's coming soon. Real soon. Probably sooner than I expect. I was telling somebody just a while ago that, you know, reading of some of the older men than I am, now they're in their hundreds if they were still here. But some of those men, great men of God, great ministers of the gospel, would say things like this. If you don't believe that Jesus is coming soon, you better get ready because at the time you leave service today and you drive home, He could come in that span of time. He could come. Some people will tell us that there's a lot that has to be done yet. I'm not a scholar of the, the Scriptures, but I want to tell you, I don't think there's anything that has to be done yet. I believe it's been accomplished that the second coming of Jesus Christ is upon us. How many believe that? Then what are we doing here? Why don't we go out and tell the people at Walmart and McDonald's that Jesus is coming soon? Because if we really believe it, we're going to be testifying to people, telling people about the goodness of God in their perilous time that they're in. As we see it and call it perilous times, The world sees it as agony upon agony and problems and they blame it on everybody else and all the things, but they never, they don't know. The Word tells us that this is upon us. It's about to happen. It's taking place. These are signs of His coming. Isn't Jesus wonderful? He's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful Lord. Turn with me to the book of 1 Thessalonians, please. Chapter 4. For scripture to start out this morning Sister Angel said, well, you'll do good because you've probably been exploding yeah, since August when I was supposed to be here. But I want to share some things with you today that I believe will encourage you as I have been so encouraged this year. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, usually read this at a funeral. But we're not having a funeral today. We're celebrating the Lord Jesus Christ and His coming back. Hallelujah. He's coming back. In verse 13, the 1 Thessalonians 4 said, But I would not have you to be ignorant, and on, you know, people that haven't heard about it, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds 
to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And verse 18 says, Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So all the things that's going wrong, the storms and the earthquakes and the prices and everything that's happening, I want you to look at verse 18. I want to encourage you with these words that Jesus is coming back soon. Let it be a comfort to you as you serve Him. But again, if you're not serving Him or you walked away from Him, I know what that's all about. I did it for 15 and a half years. I know how miserable you can be when you know you should be following Christ and you're not. I'm not proud of that, but I want to share that with you because if you once served Jesus, and you, I used to go to the altar every time, Brother Don, doesn't make any difference what preacher it was, because we'd have hellfire and brimstone preachers that, boy, you could fire that, you could feel the heat on your feet from them preaching about hell. And I'd run to the altar as a little kid. And fall down and cry out, I didn't want to go to hell. I didn't want to get in that fire. And then the next one would come by and they'd say, talk about how great heaven is. All they'd describe it and, hey, it was so great. I want to go there. So I'd go to the altar. I went to the altar, I don't know, probably 50 times or more as just a kid. Now, I know at least one of those times took. Pastor Ken said he was baptized many times, but he knew when he came here and got in our baptistry, that was it. He knew it took, right? So I know that at least one of those 50 times or so, God really heard my prayer, right? But when I became a senior in high school, I walked away from God. I'm not going to tell you why, but because some of those hypocrites that was in church, that was the main reason. But... (laughs) That woke somebody up. Uh, That was one of the reasons. And the enemy used those things and drove me away from God. Not proud of that, but I want to tell you that because if you've been running from God, guess what? He has been there all the time. He hasn't went anywhere. He loves you. He loves you. You may have done some stupid things, and I'm not going to talk about that because I want to talk about Jesus. So I'm not going to talk about my stupid stuff, but you may have done some dumb things. But guess what? He still loves you. All you have to do is say, here I am, Lord, please forgive me. And guess what? He will forgive you. He will forgive you. I thank God for His love for us. Whether we're lovable or not, He loves us. Amen? And so if I don't forget, I do want to say a public thanks to my wife and my nurse this year, Miss Mary. Thank you, hon. Without her, I wouldn't be here. And I thank God for her. Amen. Yes. You see, God allowed His Son... Jesus to die on that old rugged cross. And you know, I don't know if you've ever really thought about that. The Son of God hanging there. You know, I said he could have called 10,000 angels. He could have. But he was thinking of you, Jim and Jane and Sue and Ray. And he didn't call on anybody. He died there that you and I might be saved from our sins. That's a loving God. That is a loving God. See, Jesus shed his life blood for you and for me. He took the stripes on his back for the healing of our bodies. Some of you and most of you know that this year has not been a very good year for me physically. Uh, bought a battle ever since January and, uh, of this year. And there was a time that I didn't think anybody knew, but I found out in my family, they knew. But folks, there was a time period there where I didn't know whether I was going to make it or not. Not because the enemy was telling me I wasn't going to make it. It was just because of my physical structure and my physical being. When you, don't, you can't even get out of your easy chair because you don't have any strength, you know something's wrong. And... Uh, I don't want you to feel sorry for me because I'm going to tell you what God did for me and then you can applaud Jesus. But uh, I didn't know, but I put my trust in confidence in God. Now, Pastor has a little, I had it in here and I must have dropped it. 
the little healing scriptures. Now, I'm not going to say, well, I was way far ahead of him, but I was in ministry a few years before he. Before he was ever in ministry, I put this little paper together. I don't know if you can read that. It says scriptures of healing or scriptures for healing. I put this together for some people a long, long time ago. Because I felt in my heart they wouldn't take something like Pastor Ken put together and look the scripture up. They would just forget it and not look. So I put it together and I put it in large print so they could read it. So when the enemy attacked me and things started to happen to me physically, I thought of this piece of paper. And I pulled it out. And I began to read it. I read it at least twice a day since January, the 20th of January. That was my older brother's birthday. Just one scripture in the Old Testament, Isaiah 55, 5. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement was peace upon him. By his stripes we are healed. All the New Testament scriptures. So I would read these scriptures over and over and over. And guess what? The Word works. The Word works. The Word works. Because during that time, then the enemy started coming after me. And he started reminding me of people that I knew of that I had prayed for and they died anyhow. Like the old preacher said, his wife asking him, so what are you doing? said, every Sunday morning you're praying for the sick and nothing's happening, they're dying. He said, well, one of these days I'll pray for one and they'll live. So he's going to keep praying for them. So, first of all, I want to say to you, I thank all of you for your prayers. For your prayers and standing with us. For your love, the support that many, many people gave us and gave me and showed to Mary and I during that time. I personally thank you. See, I went to the urologist just not too long ago and got a good report that there is no more cancer in my bladder. <laughs> Hallelujah. She told me that, says you have the cancer of a 49 year old man our bladder of the 49-year-old man. I said, praise God. Praise God. No more. And I took no radiation, no chemo, nothing. He just looked at me and said, I don't understand, but we don't have to give you anything. I said, I understand. I understand. Anyway, my cardiologist released me and said that my heart valve was working fine. I had a new heart valve put in. My aortic valve, and that's doing fine. He told me I could go preach again because one of the things he told me when he was talking to me, he says, so you preach, huh? And I said, yeah. And he says, no more preaching till I get this valve fixed. Well, I want to tell you something. I was the week I couldn't preach anyhow. I did go on May the 19th uh, over to Victory Tabernacle over at the Riffets. And I preached that morning, but you know something? I was standing at the pulpit, and all of a sudden I felt all the strength in my legs leaving me. And so I jumped to my closing page <laughs> and closed. And we had a good meeting. I don't think anybody knew. I don't think that they married. I don't think anybody realized anything was even happening to me. I went out to the car, and I had no problem walking out to the car. But then they took me to eat, and I was going to gain weight. See, so they go, to, they go to the eating place, and that's where I had my accident and fell over backwards on my back. And uh, I was with, with uh, Sister Kim Riffett and her daughter, who is a uh, nurse practitioner or whatever. But anyway, they took care of me and uh, got me into the hospital and found out what all was going wrong with me and all that stuff. So I wanted to report that to you. See, I got a good report concerning everything. My blood count went down to 5.4, and that's why I collapsed and didn't have any strength. And they couldn't figure out what was wrong with that, how, what was causing all of that. Well, 
Because of the other things wrong with it, they wouldn't do anything. They wouldn't do a, they wouldn't do a colonoscopy. They wouldn't do a scope and, and, and they, down my throat or anything. So they put that off and put that off and put it off. But I went and took all those things in the upper GI endoscopy, I think they call it, and my, uh, for my esophagus, and then a good report on the colonoscopy procedure. I had no blockage, nothing wrong, had a few polyps. And I got a great report there and everything was fine. So that's why I'm standing up here today. I, you know, I stand before you, I can say a healed man. Amen. Amen. Now, I tell you, I would have much rather be able to stand here and tell you that Brother, Brother Shannon and Brother Don and the elders anointed me with oil and praise God, I didn't have to have a valve replacement. That didn't happen, but hey, God intervened and the people that he put in my life took care of those things and fixed me and now I'm strong. There for a while they wouldn't let me do anything and now I'm doing whatever I want to do. And I just <laughs> praise God that my age I'm able to do that. See, it's the enemy that didn't want me up here. But I want to tell you something. He can't stop me. He can't stop me. Now during this time... I have had a lot of opportunities to witness to people. More than I've ever had, probably. And when God opens the door, I thought, why wasn't I doing this before? You know, the door can, can open real easy just by someone saying, boy, I got a terrible headache and I've had one for two days and don't know what to do. You say, oh, feel bad, take a Tylenol. No! You say, Jesus is here, let me pray for you. And you know it's a funny look on people's face when they say, well, yeah, you can pray for me, and you just grab their hand and start praying, and you open your eyes, and they're, <laughs> they're staring at you. What are you doing? Uh, well, you told me I could pray. I'm praying. <laughs> you know, that's why I ask you if I could pray. So the devil can't stop me, and he can't stop you. Just for a reference, when I was ordained in 1975, the Lord gave a tongue and interpretation, and in part of that, it's a lengthy thing, but in part of that, he said that God was telling me because I was wondering whether I was called to preach or whether I was following my dad. And God said these words. He says, I have called thee. And listen to what God said. I have called thee. Those that I call, I will sustain. You know, I've stood on that all these years. This year, I got that thing out and I read it over and over. God, I'm, I'm believing in you. And guess what? It came true. He's sustaining me. Now, he, does, he said that to me. But God is no respecter of person. If he'll sustain me, he will sustain you also. All you have to do is believe. Believe what his word says. Why? Because in Psalms 138.7, it says, Though I walk in the midst of trouble, that will revive me. Thou shalt stretch forth thy hand against the wrath of mine enemies, and thy right hand shall save me. Verse 8 of 138 of Psalms, The Lord will perfect that which concerneth me. Thy mercy, O Lord, endureth forever. Forsake not the works of thine own hand. Guess what? God intervened when the devil tried to take me out. He'll do the same thing for you. If you'll just trust him, he'll do the same thing for you today. I better get to my notes. I, I only got four pages. I haven't even finished one, so I, I don't know what I'm going to do. God knows, though. God knows. He knows. Look with me at the book of Jude, verse 20. Those that came forward, I really believe... If God told me in August and I had to wait this long to pray for you, you're healed. <laughs> I just believe that. Verse 20 of Jude. That's just before Revelation. But ye, beloved, who is the beloved? You. Building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ and eternal life, and of some have compassion, making a difference. That's where I got my title from. 
God gave me that scripture, matter of fact, while I was sitting here in a meeting. And that's where I got my title, Making a Difference in the Last Days. You'll have the love of God, you'll have the compassion of God, and all the other things that God has given us that we might be successful. But we need to maintain a life with God and make a difference in this world around about us. I feel bad at times that I don't go minister more and uh, I never have felt like calling people. I know hundreds of people. I know enough people. I think if I called a hundred, I'd get one time to speak somewhere, but God hasn't prompt, prompted me to do that. There's times I get concerned about it, then there's times I just say, no, I'm going to stay where you want me to do, God, and I'm just going to do what you want me to do. So, uh, but we can make a difference in this world. And that is the important thing about our walk in God, is making the difference in people's lives. I believe that if I can use this term, it's high time. Scripture uses it a couple times in the Word. It's high time for the church to be the church. The church to be the church. See, God has given His, his church all the tools we need to evangelize not just Preble County, but the world. His Word, His Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, the power of prayer, the authority over the devil, and all of these work in our lives if we'll just allow it to happen. How does it happen? In Acts chapter 8, chapter 1, verse 8, it said, but ye receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in both Jerusalem and Judea and into the uttermost part of the earth. Listen, we already have the power that is needed to touch our neighbors and our family and our friends. Now, if you've got family that's not serving God, don't believe the old lie that the devil says. If you say anything to them, you'll run them further away from God. The devil's used that and kept your families and my families out of the, the goodness of God because we won't say anything. There's no place in the Bible that tells us, okay, they're a member, family member, don't say anything to them. Just get that old rotten neighbor that blows his leaves over in your yard. Talk to him. No, love everybody. Tell everybody the goodness of God, the things about God. All that will work. In, in chapter 2, verse 1 and when they, of, of, of Acts, and when the day of Pentecost had come, they were with one accord in one place. One of the things the church of Jesus Christ needs to be in accord or work together. Just be in accord with one another. Not a car now, but be in accord. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind and filled all that the, it filled all the house where they were sitting and were appeared upon them clothed in tongues like as a fire and set upon them and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. I would say to you today if you don't have the fullness of the baptism of the Holy Ghost with speaking in other tongues, you need that in these last days. Amen. You need that. That'll be a strength to you. That'll also be a comfort to you. That'll be something you can use to do what you need to do in these last days. Amen. To tell people about Jesus Christ. That clock isn't right, is it? That can't be right. Real quickly. Romans chapter 13. Verse 11. And that knowing the time, and now is high time, to wake out of sleep... For now salvation is nearer than it were than we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envy, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. I believe that the hour of the church is it we're in right now is a very, very, very special time. See, God has anointed His church, His children, with His Word and the Holy Spirit to reach those that are in this world that needs a Savior. That should be our first most emphasis of our life. If we don't get busy and get our job done, there's going to be a lot of people 
die and go to a devil's hell. That should have been saved. So as far as this local church, God has shared with us more than one time, and I want to reiterate it one more time, that he has put this church here for a light to this community to share the fullness of God and the fullness of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit. Folks, I don't know how many prophecies we've received in the context of that's what God planted this place for. That we would be a light to this community. But we need to do more because time is running out. We don't have much time left. We need to do more than we've ever done. I believe that the coming of the Lord is at hand and it could happen today. It could happen today. I want to quickly share with you that uh, there's someone here today that... You've been reluctant to step out and even witness to your neighbor or anybody. And the main reason you've been reluctant to is because of what someone has said to you or about you and the things that they've spread about you of the past. I've told a lot of people, listen, a person can walk out of the bar downtown on Saturday night and you see them staggering and, uh, you know, with a bottle in their hand. But how do we know before they got home that night, they fell on their face before God and cried out, God have mercy on me. But we Christians, a year later, are still talking about them walking down the street with a bottle in their hand. I think the Word of God calls that gossipers. Guess what? We won't make it to heaven if we're one of those. Pray for those people, don't talk about those people. See, we don't know what somebody said to God after we saw them 10 minutes later. We don't know. We don't know, folks. So you need to move out, whoever you are, and do what God is calling you to do. And don't let people hinder you. If I, if I would have let people hinder me, I would have quit a long time ago. Don't let people hinder you. Do what God is calling you to do. When people bring up your past, if you want to, just look at them and say, hey, Jesus dropped all those charges when I accepted Him as Lord Savior. He don't even know about them anymore. He wiped my slate clean. Oh, I made a mistake since then. That's good. He's faithful and just. If we'll ask forgiveness, He'll forgive us. He'll forgive us. Right? See, God said He's going to pour out His Spirit on our sons and our daughters and our young people. And when would He do it? He said, why? He wants to do it now. He said He would do it because He wants to use all of us. How many give me two minutes? Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. Okay, got it. I got it. Thank you. Uh, I need to say something before I quit. Because God prompted me so much about this, especially in these couple of last months that I've been just waiting to get strength back that I might be able to share again at this place in this pulpit. There's nobody in this house, none of you, that could understand how I feel. There's just nobody. And that God has given me the grace, to, the mercy to be here. Uh, no one would doubt that Pastor Ken and others that go with him, but Pastor Ken is the leading person, is making a difference in Africa and other places of the world and in this place. I think everybody would agree with that. But we, say me, we, the people of Covenant of Peace, have a part in that that he's doing. Now, some believe that he ought to be here today and I shouldn't even be here. I had the same thing when I was pastor. If you take a vacation for three days, they think you done went to hell and back, you know. As pastor, he wasn't supposed to go. But you could go 
and spend a week, and that's okay. I don't know why people think that way. How are we having a part in what he's doing? By our giving, by our sending, by our prayers, by our support, and our faithfulness to the local church. We're having a great part in it. But each of us individually can make a difference in our homes, with our families, in our workplace, at our school, in our neighborhood. So if we, the church, if we're not any different than those of the world, then that world will never see Jesus. So we have a work to do. So it's time for us to come to where God is going to begin to use people at Kopi. That how he showed me in these last couple of months that he's going to do it. That's why I had to share this with you. So thank you for the extra couple minutes. But God is going, to, not that he's not doing anything now. When I say something, somebody's like, well, he's downing Pastor Harbaugh and God's not doing it. I'm, hey, God's doing great things. But like the old black preacher said, you ain't seen nothing yet, honey. Listen, God has been showing me some things, and I sit down at my computer, and I think, man, I could write a book here, but I'm no, I'm not supposed to write a book. He's just speaking to my spirit. And so I wrote this down. The time has come that God is going to begin to use the people of Covenant of Peace International in ministry outside these four walls and winning the loss to Jesus in healings and in miracles like never before. And God prompted me to write, and I got it right here in the yellow, mark my word. I said it because God told me. It's going to take place. But hey, you got to get off your duffs of not too many months, about months ago now. It was weeks at first when God spoke to me. The pastor stood here and he said, if you're sitting on your hands, you need to get off your hands and start doing something. I would say that to you. If you're sitting on your hands, get off of them and begin to do something, or these kind of things will never take place. You say, well, I was baptized in the Holy Ghost 20 years ago, and I'm, I'm doing... Hey, I don't care if you was baptized in the Holy Ghost 50 years ago. It's what, where are you at now? How much Holy Ghost do you have now? Are you filled now? Are you overflowing? The worship team, please come so I can be quiet. But if you're going to make a difference, you're going to have to have the fullness of God now, now in your life. And he'll do it for you. Amen. He'll do it for you. So where are you at today? Do you really want to make a difference? Are you running and are you full of the Holy Ghost right now? Let me ask you a question. Are you, are you allowing the Holy Spirit to lead you and guide you so you can make a difference in this last time, in the last days. Stand with me. Father, I thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord. We got to share part of what you gave me. I thank you for that time. And I just thank you, Father, that you're a God that you'll never leave us, never forsake us. You're faithful. You are a faithful, faithful God. So I ask you today, God, to honor your word. I come, I trust what I intended to do was really challenge these people of this church that we'd do more for you in these last days. Because you promised that you'd fill this place. The prophecies that's gone forth. Not just for salvations, it's people coming to receive miracles of healing. And while we worship, Lord, while we're just worshiping you, people are jumping out of wheelchairs and cots. Lord, that's been a prophecy to this place. I believe it will only happen when we do our part. So help us, Lord, that we'll be faithful to you just as you are faithful to us. We'll thank you and praise you, Father, in Jesus' precious name.